Hebrews 9 and jump down to verse 22. And all I want to do today is explain some things to set up communion service um, so we can appreciate a little deeper what Christ has done for us. If you're at verse 22, say amen. Amen. Here's what it says. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Repeat that to me. Say, without the shedding of blood... There is no forgiveness of sins. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, your sins are forgiven because Jesus is blood. Point to yourself, say, self, I am covered by the blood. Amen. Let me, let me, amen, amen. Let me, let me read something for you, um, just a couple of things that I, I jotted down here that I want to read for you. Then I'll explain uh, some things as it relates to the text this morning. Uh, Because of its association with life, blood takes on a special significance in the sacrificial motive. On the Day of Atonement, the blood of a bull and of a goat was sprinkled upon the altar as a covering of the people's sin. Life was poured out, um, life was poured out in death. Animal life was given up on behalf of the life of the people. Judgment and atonement were carried out through a transfer of the sin of the people to the animal sacrifice. Transference is then depicted also by the scapegoat in the same ceremony. In the first Passover, the blood bore the same meaning. Animal blood was posted on each door. On each door, it was a sign that a death had already taken place. So the angel of death passed over. Further, because life is connected with blood, blood becomes a supreme offering to God. In the ratification of the covenant, Moses poured half of the sacrificial blood on the altar. And after reading the covenant to the people and receiving their affirmative response, he sprinkled the rest of the blood on them and said, This blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you in giving you these laws. Sprinkling blood on both the altar and on the people bound God and the people together in a covenantal relationship. In the sacrifices of Israel, blood stood for death and depending on the context might also stand for judgment, sacrifice, substitution, or redemption. Life with God is made possible by Jesus' blood. Come on, say amen, right? So what I want to do today briefly as we go into our communion, before we go into our communion services, is I just want to do a subtle reminder, just a really brief reminder of the importance of what the blood of Christ did for us so we can not, so we can really get a deeper understanding of what that means. But for us to really appreciate what the blood of Jesus is all about and what happened on the cross of Calvary by his death, his burial, and resurrection, I think it's very, very important that we look briefly at some Old Testament context to give you a framework of what was happening in the Old Testament cultic system. And when I use the word cultic system, I'm just simply speaking about the Old Testament sacrificial system, what they did in offering sacrifices for the remission of sin, and then connect that to today, and then we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together. Is that all right, y'all? Amen. So I want you to back up with me to um, Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll be dealing with Hebrews chapter 9 And um, I'm just going to do, it's going to be all of verses 1 through, what is that, 10 for literary context. But um, for me to do that, I need to kind of walk you through um, just a picture. This maybe will help you understand a little better um, what's going on. So can you guys see that picture all right? This picture is is my attempt to illustrate or to, to paint a picture of what verses 9 through 10 says, and then I will talk about verses 11 to 22. Seems like a lot of verses, but I'm going to move fast so it won't take long. So the picture you see on the screen in front of you is what I'm going to refer to, or what was referred to in the biblical time as the Old Testament temple. There was the outer courts of the temple. Um, There was the the, uh, inner courts. 
And then when you get to this picture that's on the wall, this is where the people would go to get their sins recompensed, atoned for, or forgiven. So the picture you see is what would be known as the inner courts or the holy, the holy, uh, the holy of holies um, within the temple of Jerusalem. Now, what's important for you to notice on the screen, this is Old Testament. Everybody say Old Testament. Old Testament. One more time, say Old Testament. Old Testament. So I want you to notice with me, and, and some of you might track where I'm going, that the temple was a physical place. The temple was a physical building. The temple was a physical locale where the priests went to offer their sacrifices and to do their duties to um, recompense for the sins of people. So when you look at the picture, you will notice on the outside, this is called, the, the first part of this is called the most holy place. So it consisted of two curtains. There was a first curtain that's sitting back here that the priest would go in, and the priest would go in, and then that first section where you see the priest standing there, bless his heart for some sort of a priest, um, there were certain elements that existed within that most holy place in the temple. There was what we call the golden candle stand, right? The candle stand was there. There was the table um, of the most of, of the showbread that was there, right? Those tables were there. You can see what was happening there. Um, there was a consecrated bread that was over there, and there was the table. Now, here's what would happen. Every day, every, come on, say every day. Every day when the people went to the temple, the priests on a daily basis would go into that first chamber of the temple and he would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. This was a daily basis. What's important for you to realize is that the people themselves were not authorized to go into the most holy place of the temple. The priest was their representative. Does this make sense? So if I sinned, this is where you would see I would either have to take a goat or a, a, a ram or a sheep or a dove, depending on what the sacrifice was, and I would give it to the priest, and the priest then would offer that thing for me, but that first chamber is where he would offer what he was offering. And here's the thing that would happen, is he would take the animal, he would kill the blood of the animal, and he would sprinkle the blood of the animal on the elements that you see in there. Most of y'all didn't notice. As a sign of covering a person's sin or enable them to be forgiven for their sins. Now, the second chamber that's behind the curtains is what would be called the most holy place, or some of us would refer to it as the holy of holies. Here's what would happen in the holy of holies, is that once a year, not every single day, but once a year, the high priest would then enter that place, and as he goes into that place, what existed in the holy place, if we can, I want you to see what existed there. Back in there, you had the golden altar of incense, right? You had the Ark of the Covenant that was inside of that thing. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, they had samples of the manna. They had Aaron's rod. They had the Ten Commandments on the inside. And then you will notice the uh, angel's wings that's sitting on, on the outside of that, right? The seraphim wings that, that are hovering over. And that was on the inside of the most holy place. So once a year, once a year, a priest would go in there and then he would offer sacrifice for the people's sin that they may have committed omissively, meaning sins they may not even known they had committed. Now, what's interesting about the diagram or this picture that's on the screen that I want you all to know about is that before any priest went into that thing, here's what they had to do. To make sure that they were right before God, they themselves had to kill an animal and they had to offer sacrifices for themselves for their own forgiveness of sin before they can go before the temple or before the, the tabernacle and order sac offer sacrifices for God. So in other words, if they went in and they had unforgiven sin, something likely would go wrong with them. They were not qualified to forgive my sin if they had not dealt with their sins first. Okay? Here's the interesting thing about the Holy of Holies. Once a year, once again, 
That priest himself had to offer sacrifice for himself, the high priest. He had to kill a lamb. He had to sprinkle blood all over the place. And then when he went into the holies of holies, he had to repeat the process again to sprinkle blood all over the place so he can be right and the people can be right so he can be qualified to go into the presence of God. Old Testament. Come on, say Old Testament. Old Testament. I don't know about you, but I'm glad... Am I the only one, y'all? I don't think I would have been called to preach in the Old Testament. Oh, come on. I know some of y'all out there preaching. Preachers, you better say the same thing. I don't think we'd qualify either. Amen? Come on. Are you with me? Because it was a lot of work. Are you with me? It was a lot of work. But that was the Old Testament cultic system. And, and bless the heart of the priest that was on the outer chamber, every single day, every single day, depending on rotation, this was the system of forgiveness. Because you got to lock into this. Every day people sinned. Are you with me? Now, now here's what y'all missing. Here's what you're missing, right? Is, is that you're thinking it's like just like it is today. One priest goes in and he covers the sins of all the people. No, 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 no. If, 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 if Sister Pat sinned, are you with me? Priest had to go in there for her. Then he had to come out. And if Shonda sinned, y'all, y'all, ah, he had to, yeah, you get it. He had to go in there for her. Come on, are you with me? And if Annette sinned, come on, y'all. You get it now? So imagine where the priest lived. Imagine the importance of the Levitical tribe, right? Because one somebody couldn't do that all day long. Come on, y'all. Y'all get the thing. It was a constant back and forth. And now you can imagine how long that most high priest had to stay in there when his turn came to go into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifices. You saw how cumbersome that was. Y'all get this. Because I know here's, here's what y'all thinking. It's one priest covering everybody's sin. Now don't make that mistake. Get your own animals. My animal did you no good. My animal was for me. Y'all get this. This is why, this is why you'll understand the parable now when Jesus showed up and the money changers had set up table within the temple. Here's what was happening. If you came to temple worship and you didn't have an animal, they had a system set up where they'd sell you one for yourself. Oh, come on, y'all get this, right? So the priests could go in. Now, I want to jump to, 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 that's the Old Covenant. Come on, say Old Covenant. And here's the important thing for you to understand about the whole Covenant. It was still all about the blood. 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 About the, blood. the only issue was, it was the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and doves and birds. Right? And here it was. It was only symbolic of an external cleansing. Y'all get that? So that cow died and that sheep died and that goat died. It did nothing for the inside. It only symbolized what happened on the outside. Does this make sense? Okay. And then now if you, got, if you have time, jump real quick over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. Let me see if I have a moment to read this real quick, and then we're going to come back to Hebrews and then just share a couple of things uh, from Hebrews, and then we're going to allow God to be God, okay? Hebrews, I mean, Jeremiah chapter 31. Y'all, come on, go real, real quick. If you got electronic devices, you can get there really, really fast. Amen. Jeremiah 31, and give me a minute to read these verses. If you're there, say amen. 31 and 31. You there? Now notice this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Come on, say new covenant. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke through, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law, where? Within them, and I will write it, where? On their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be, what? My people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, um, Know the Lord, 
for they shall all know me from the least of them to the who? The greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. Okay? So here's what the prophet says, that a day is coming when God is going to be doing something completely differently, right? And so here's pretty much what it says. The day is coming when God says, I'm going to do away with the temple cultic system. I like that. Right? So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. That means that the Old Testament priest, because understand, the Old Testament priest is not going to be needed anymore. Now, here's the thing that I didn't say. Outside here, outside here, where the priest was, where the lamp was, where the showbread and all that stuff, was just going barely close enough to where God was for sin to be forgiven. Understand with me. For them to really get in the presence of God, they had to go into the holies of holies where the box was. The Ark of the Covenant. So lock into this. It was only once a year that a priest, I'm pointing to the screen, ain't no picture up there. That a priest had access to God. Oh, y'all get that, right? Once a year that he had access to God, and then Jeremiah gives this prophetic thing, and then here's what Jeremiah says, I'm doing away with the priest, but I'm keeping God. (laughs) Right? And the deep thing that he says prophetically, I'm keeping God, but he's not going to be in a box. Y'all getting this, right? And, and you know what happened? You know what happened in Matthew when Jesus died? Now, now this is going to make sense. The veil of the temple was torn in what? Two. Meaning what? At the death, the death of Christ, that, that curtain that exists there was ripped apart, meaning that God gave us complete, I wish I had somebody. I, yeah, yeah, this is going to make sense now. You kind of get what I'm saying? So that whole temple system was destroyed, and a new temple was established, right? Now, here's the thing. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm excited about this because here's what the Scripture says. In the Old Testament, the temple was a building. In the New Testament, the temple is what? Yeah, yeah you kind of get it. You kind of get it. And here's the beauty of, of the temple being this. It's not an outer and an inner chamber. It's not an outer and an inner court. God just resides. I wish I had somebody in here. He just resides, right? So let's walk this out. So now notice the text. I'm just going to read and exposit, then we go to our communion service. It says verse 11, but when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that has come, okay, it says here, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, look at verse 12, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the mean of his what? I wish I had somebody that can say own blood. Watch this now. Thus securing an eternal redemption. Let me read this. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of, uh, uh, on the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify the purification of the flesh. Love verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Let me help you out with this. Here's what happened. Here's what Jesus did. And you've got to lock into this. You've got to get the depth of what happened. This is why the importance of that picture was so critical. Jesus comes on the scene. And then the whole premise of him being on the scene was to make it to Calvary to die in my place and to die in your place. Now, you've got to understand the importance of what Calvary was all about and what was going on on Calvary. And you've got to understand the importance of his blood being shed for my sins to be forgiven. In the Old Testament, here's what would happen. They would bring the sacrifice in and they would come and they would place the sacrifice on the altar. And the important thing about the sacrifice being on the altar, the person remained alive and the animal died in their place. Okay, and then lock into this. And then the priest would take the animal and he would kill the animal, but the priest would stay alive. 
And he would take that dead animal and he would take the blood and he would sprinkle it on all the elements, but he had no access to the holy place. Come on. So this was even done on the outside. Here's what Hebrews is saying. When Jesus came on the scene, he, he I wish I had somebody in here. He came and then he offered himself on that altar. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why he says, nobody takes my life. I lay it down myself. I wish I had somebody in here. So he places himself on the altar. Then he allows himself to be killed. And then he gets up off the altar and he picks himself up. I wish I had somebody. And because he has access to the holies of holies, he goes past the holy of holy and he offers himself to God and he says this, Father, into I wish I had somebody. Into your hand I commend my spirit. And here's what the author's saying. If a sheep could purify you on the outside, How much more does the son, well, not, let me not say son of God. God himself incarnated in flesh. He dies, lock into this, once for all. Y'all didn't get that. If I sinned on Monday, I had to bring a sheep Monday. If I sinned on Tuesday, I had to bring a sheep Tuesday. Some of y'all up in here, up in here, y'all sinned Monday morning, and you had to bring a sheep Monday morning, and you went to work and cussed somebody out, and on your lunch break, you had, come on, y'all, come on, you had to bring a sheep on your lunch break, yeah, 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 and then you got a break in the afternoon. And you went off on your boss. Yeah. And you had to get a sheep. Yeah. Oh, y'all not hearing me? Because <laughs> you know how we act. Come on. We don't just sin one. I wish. Yeah. Well, let me talk about myself. I don't just sin once a day. It's a continual process. So my farm, all my animals would be dead because of me. Yeah. Hebrew says, yeah. once. Yeah. I wish I had a witness. <laughs> once. Come on, I wish I had a witness. He said once. I wish I had a witness. He said once for all, he died, and it covered my morning sin. It covered my afternoon sin. It covered my evening sin. It covered my next day sin. It covered my tomorrow sin. It covered my month from now. I wish I had somebody in here. It didn't only cover my sin. It covered my children's sin. And my children's children's sin. So here's what. He doesn't have to die no more. And then he did away with the temple. He did away with the temple. And the prophet says, then he puts his word where? Yeah, in my heart, right? You kind of get this? And then, and then, and then, I'm hurrying up, but then the thing says, then he establishes this thing called a new covenant. Come on, say new covenant. Say it again, say new covenant. It's a new covenant. Now, here's the thing before I even read this. Well, let me just read it. Let me read it because you all going to see it in the text because I think this makes sense. When I'm trying to tell you that I'm covered by the blood, it's going to make sense in a little while. Look at verse 15. It says, therefore, he is the mediator of the new covenant. That means he goes and he does this between God and I so that those who are called may receive the promise, and I love this, eternal inheritance. This is going to mess some of your theology up, but lock into this. If he died once and forgive all my sin and I accept him, guess what happens? I cannot undo what he did. Because here's how Hebrew says it in Hebrew 6. Am I going to cause him to die again because I forfeit my... No, 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 no. I can't undo what he did. So when he saved me, he saved me. I'm saved. I'm secure. Are you locked into this? Don't make the mistake into thinking I'm saying because you're saved, you have a license to sin. No, 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 no. Here's how Romans 6 says. Shall we continue in sin that grace abound? No. Because it says what? We died to sin. Here's what that means. If he laid his life down and he died, I 
I've got to lay my life down, and I've got to die with. I wish I had somebody. So Galatians 2 and 20 says it this way. I am crucified with Christ, right? Nevertheless, what? I live, yet not I, but Christ lives where? In me, and the life I live in the flesh. I live after the Son of God. So if he dies, I got to die, Pastor Vernon. You got to die. You kind of get what I'm saying? And as long as I stay dead, I can live forever. I wish I had somebody. <laughs> I'm almost there. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. <sighs> look at this. It says here, therefore, verse 15, he is the mediator of the new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised internal inheritance. Don't miss that word internal. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. Jesus died. First covenant is done. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at what? So you see what happened on Calvary? Since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. That's why he had to die. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had then been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of the calves of goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded you. And in this way he sprinkled the blood both on the tent and all the vessel used to worship. Verse 22, indeed under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And I like this. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So, Old Testament, the priest would take the animal and he would sprinkle the blood on everything. And then he'd say, son, your sins are forgiven. Right? Catholicism. Here's what the Catholics do. Your sins are forgiven. Then they'd add works to it. Go and do ten Hail Marys. And I used to be Catholic, so I know. Kind of get what I'm saying? Go do this. They'd add works to what the thing. Here's what Jesus did. Y'all going to get this now. He comes and he tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I don't need you on this one. I just need to borrow the Roman soldiers. Because I am my own priest. He lays himself down. And before they pierce him on the side, he said, let the record reflect. No man takes my life unless I give it to him. All right, go ahead. I'm giving you permission to kill this lamb for the sins of the world. The Roman soldier kills him. Then he, three days, he picks himself up. And he takes his blood. And he sprinkles it over you. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, I'm covered by the blood. And he sprinkles it over you. Come on. And he sprinkles it over you. Matter of fact, he has so much sprinkling to do that his father couldn't look at him. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, he had taken on the sins of the entire world while he was sprinkling. But then when he got done, he took his body and he laid it in his father's head. I wish I had somebody in here. And he says, now when he comes, lock into this, he made us, he made you, and he made me our own priests. Amen. So here was St. Peter. You're a royal priesthood. A holy people, a nation called out to God. So here's what that means. When you sin, well, Felix, talk about yourself. When you sin, Felix, you can come and you don't have to stop at the altar. And you ain't got to bring no animals. Because <laughs> Jesus already paid the price. Matter of fact, you can climb up on the altar. And you can go straight to the holy of holies and walk in. And you and God can have a dialogue for yourself because of the new covenant that has been sealed 
and establish by the blood of the Lamb. I don't care what you say. I know his blood still works. Because when Satan thought he had the best of me, I said to him, I'm covered by the blood. When sickness stepped in, I can say I'm covered by the blood. Come on. When bankruptcy stepped in, I can say I'm covered by the blood. When people try to get the blessed of me, it was nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. You ask me, what can wash away my sin? I'm going to tell you it is nothing. Come on, you know it. But the blood. When I said, what can make me whole again? I say what? Nothing but, oh, come on, come on, come on. For his pardon, this I plea. I say what? Nothing but the blood. But then when I get excited, I say, oh, how precious is, I wish I had somebody in here. Oh, how precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Do I have any blood-washed Christians in this place? Any blood-washed believers in this place? Anybody that know he died for them? Anybody that know he came to save them? Anybody in here that's covered by the blood? Covered by the blood? Covered by the blood? Covered by the blood? I don't know about you, but when I think about the goodness of Jesus, and all, <laughs> oh, Brother Jeff, oh, he didn't have to do it, but he did, but he did, and I thank him for what he did, because I have access now. I'm a priest. You're a priest. You're children of God. No curtain can block you. Come on, is this making sense? Come on, stand to your feet all over this building. All over this building, stand to your feet. Come on, say nothing but blood. And then say, I'm covered by the blood. Here, here. Here's what I want y'all to get. Here's what I want y'all to get. Here's what I want you to get. Here's how Corinthians said it, right? Here's what Corinthians said. This cup, he says, is the new covenant in my blood. He says, do this as often as... As you drink it, what? In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Here's what, this is Felix. This is Felix. I think the picture he's trying to get us to see is every time you take that cup, see him. See him covering you with his blood. So when you drink it, you're partaking with me in the work. A new covenant, 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 a new covenant. If you haven't received element, raise your hands. I want Darshan to get one to you. We're going to take a moment in prayer. The blood that Jesus shed for me. Come on, say way back, come on. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day. Come on, y'all know. Today, it will never lose its power. It reaches, come on, you know what, come on, say. It reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows, come on, say. And it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, yeah. The blood, come on. The blood that gives me strength from day. It will never, it will never. It's mine. Come on, one more time, all over the building. It reaches, it reaches to the high, to the highest mountain. And it flows, come on, say. Never lose. 
as you're standing in the presence of God, I want you for your own self to reflect on everything you've heard this morning and say, God, I thank you. Come on, in your own way, go to him. In your own way, in your own way. Go to him. Don't be afraid to open your mouth and go to him and say, Lord, I thank you. I've been taking lightly to work on Calvary. I've been taking lightly your blood. I've been taking lightly your finished work. Go to him this morning and allow with him. Allow him to be God this morning. Father, as we come to the table, God, these elements, God, are symbolic of your body that was broken. It's symbolic of your blood that was shed. We understand even more better now what the priests did and what you did. We thank you for the new covenant, God, and we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you, God, for you. We thank you for you. Now we understand when the songwriter said, flows to the lowest valley, because everyone can have access to the cross, God. There is yet room. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. We give this to you, God, that you get the praise. The bread that's symbolic of your body broken, pierced in your side for us, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, God. The chastisements of your stripes are on you, and by your stripes we are healed. We thank you, God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, God, for what you did. Now we know why you told your disciples, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Don't miss, don't miss what you did. Don't miss what you did. Don't miss what you did. We thank you, God. We thank you. The blood, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never As Jesus stood in the room with his disciples on that night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body which was broken for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me where we eat together. And in the same way, <laughs> after he had given thanks, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant that the record reflect. I am covering you in my blood. As often as you drink it, he says, do it in remembrance of me. Let us cover ourselves with the blood of the Lamb. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Oh, yeah, come on. I know it was the blood for me. Come on, one day when I was lost, yeah. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. Thank you, God, for your blood. Thank you for the finished work of Calvary. Thank you for Hebrews 9, 11 through 22, which reminds us of what you did on this first Sunday. We remember you. And we connect with you again, God. Forgive us for taking lightly. Forgive us for forgetting. Forgive us for neglecting you, God. Thank you for covering us, God. So now the death angel will pass over us. We celebrate you. We give you praise. We give you glory, God. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen.